Hi, this is Elliot Fisherman, and welcome to our latest set of vodcasts. And this is going to be a new one on adrenal masses. And I had a good title, A Challenging Diagnosis Becomes Even More Difficult, because in many ways, people think of adrenal masses as very easy. Most masses are incidentalomas. Most are going to be adenomas. You can get metastasis. You can get a primary ACC. You can get a theo. And there's a perception, perhaps, that you could always make the right diagnosis. I think the answer is when you finish listening to this talk, which will be somewhere between three and five parts, depending how I think about it, you'll recognize that there are many specific signs that can be helpful, allowing you to make the right diagnosis, but also that things are very challenging. We have multidisciplinary conference every other Friday looking at adrenal cases, and invariably out of seven cases, there are two or three where you have to scratch your head, you have to look carefully at the clinical history, you have to look at the lab values, the imaging data, and still you're not gonna be certain whether or not this patient has a malignancy or a benign process, whether or not this patient needs surgery, whether the surgery can be an open procedure or laparoscopic. There are a lot of questions you need to answer. And hopefully in this series of talks, what I'm gonna do is give you a series of questions and give you a series of answers. Now, when you think about adrenal imaging, there's a high frequency of incidental adrenal masses, as I mentioned, most of which are adenomas or perhaps cysts or myelolyplomas, but uh, adenomas tend to rule the day. Management decisions are critical and biopsy is usually not recommended. Remember, the main reasons we'll do a biopsy is if I'm certain it's primary adrenal lymphoma, and I'll show you some examples of that, or if a patient has, for example, lung cancer, where the question is chemotherapy and what chemotherapy, depending on the presence of metastatic disease, then biopsying the adrenal gland would make some sense. But those are the few instances. Typically, imaging will focus on CT with MR and nuclear studies done in cases without a definitive diagnosis. And sometimes um, the additional studies will indeed be very helpful. And again, lesions are usually considered benign malignant and indeterminate with CT, but it is going to be a challenge. There was a recent article in um, radiographics that made the point about uh, some of the lessons they've learned from multidisciplinary tumor boards, and we've learned those same lessons and many others. I think it's important to participate in multidisciplinary conferences. You do learn a lot because it's not just the difficult cases, they kind of challenge you. It's not just meeting other people and endocrinology and surgery, uh, but it's really putting yourself to the challenge of difficult cases. So here's a couple of comments from that article. Adrenal adenoma is the most common benign adrenal tumor that arises from the adrenal cortex, whereas adrenal cortical carcinoma is a rare malignant tumor of the cortex. Adrenal cysts and myelolipomas are other benign lesions and are characterized by their flu fluid or fat content. And of course, with myelolipomas, the amount of fat can be 100% of the tumor or just a couple percent with a faint calcification, perhaps. Pheochromocytomas are rare neuroendocrine tumors of the medulla. Mets to the adrenal are the most common malignant adrenal tumors. While many of these masses have classic imaging appearances, considerable overlap exists between benign and malignant lesions and can pose a diagnostic challenge, which is the reason we're giving this series of lectures. Most recent data has shown that these values are not as specific for adenoma as previously believed, and that's talking about some of the washout values, since other tumors ranging from pheos to hypervascular mets, and even ACC can have that 60% or greater washout. Other features such as mass size, heterogeneity, and clinical context for example, a patient has a known history of a renal cell carcinoma, particularly clear cell, or hypertension suggesting pheo, and all of these must be taken into account when using washout CT. And no great surprise, all of us have always done that. You don't just say, oh, it has a 60% washout, it's an adenoma next case. Remember, most pheos enhanced above 120, so if a lesion enhances above 110, it's very difficult to simply say it's an adenoma, 
unless you really look at the lab values. Because the attenuation of simple fluid is less than or equal to 10 Hounsfield units, a homogeneous unilocular cystic adrenal lesion can mimic an adenoma. Of course, whether you call something a cyst or an adenoma, they're both benign, so perhaps you want to be most accurate, but it may not make a difference. Owing to the central hypoattenuation, cysts and pseudocysts may also mimic pheos with cystic and or necrotic change. A key feature of an adrenal cyst is its lack of enhancement. And we will speak about cystic pheos. Some people say 30 to 40% of pheos are cystic, and the pheos look necrotic. I think the biggest challenge with cystic pheos is not comparing it to a cyst. I typically do not think that's a problem. Remember, cysts are water density with no enhancement, but cystic pheos can look very much like cystic ACCs. Again, that article goes on. It may be impossible to distinguish a large atypical adenoma from an ACC or other malignant tumors with imaging because of overlapping features. If there are no benign diagnostic features, evaluation of the clinical context, including hormonal assessment, is essential for assessing the need for surgical resection of a 4CM or larger adrenal mass. Patients with a large adrenal mass should be managed by a multidisciplinary team, including surgeons, endocrinologists, and radiologists. And I think if you look statistically, the smaller a lesion, the more likely it is to be benign, but that's not always going to be the case, of course. I'll show you ACC, I'll show you FEO, I'll show you METs that are small. On the flip side, the larger a lesion gets, and people often use 4CM as a cutoff number, the larger a lesion, the more likely it is malignant. But in saying that adenomas, cysts, and the like, myelolipomas, can all be over 4CM. So size is not going to be an absolute criteria on the high end or even on the low end. Now we know adrenals have variable anatomy. People talk about adrenal weight. Since I can't weigh things, I don't worry about it. And we kind of know the variation in adrenal appearances. The adrenals do enhance, so although we don't typically say an adrenal enhances 40 Hounsfield units, if you do measure an adrenal on non-contrast and arterial and venous, you will see anywhere between a 40 to 60 Hounsfield unit enhancement, commonly in patients with normal adrenals, like this case here. Now, on the other hand, and again, this is not going to be the talk focusing on this, but when you have very bright adrenals, it usually means the patient's hypotensive. It was initially described in trauma, but it can be any reason the patient's hypotensive. Trauma, intra-abdominal bleed, a case like this with intracranial bleed, you can see the opacification of the lungs, and you see very, very bright adrenals. The adrenals are not enlarged. It's this um, flight or fright type appearance very, very bright adrenal glands. This article from way back when from Veka Tarshima made the point it's important to recognize intensely enhancing adrenal glands in morphologically normal shaped glands, especially in unwell patients, because this finding may be an early sign of impending shock, warranting early critical care management, and may also be a marker of poor prognosis in ill patients. So if you see very bright adrenals, you gotta call up the clinician and say, hey, this patient may be hypotensive or is becoming hypotensive. In another article by Cara Magula, hypovolemic shock may be seen in trauma patients and reduced blood volume typically prompts increased sympathetic activity, which can cause a constellation of findings on CT imaging. Also known as CT hypoperfusion complex, hyperenhancing mesenteric vessels, decreased aortic caliber, slit like IVC, intense enhancement of the kidneys, and dilated fluid-filled small bowel loops are the findings of this complex. On imaging, shock adrenal glands demonstrate marked enhancement with preserved contours. Persistent, intense adrenal enhancement may be a sign of shock that precedes other imaging features of hypoperfusion, and similar findings were also observed in patients with severe acute pancreatitis. So again, a very important sign to recognize. Another thing we can talk about, and just to be complete, I'll show you an example of what I would call very small adrenal glands. This patient had uh, and uh, rule out adrenal mass. This patient had a glioblastoma multiforme and back pain. 
and there was a question of bleed, you could see, look how thin the adrenal glands are, both right and left adrenal gland on the axials or the coronal views, very, very thin. And that's adrenal atrophy. It's interesting that adrenal atrophy is not something we commonly see, but it can be seen in patients with certain tumors. And this was a GBM, so it's one of those tumors. Again, the significance of adrenal atrophy might be that the patient is Addisonian. So I think the point I want to make is, even when you're not looking at adrenal masses, you always look, need to look at the adrenal. Perhaps it's a patient who's hypotensive. Perhaps it's a patient who has adrenal atrophy and is Addisonian. All of these things become very important. Now, the other thing I should mention, always that pitfall. Most of the time when someone says there's an adrenal mass present, there is an adrenal mass present, but not always. Things that I've seen confused with adrenal masses, the stomach, sometimes just a diverticulum off the stomach simulating a left adrenal mass, pancreas lesions, retroperitoneal masses, all can push the adrenal where it's hard to see, and perhaps then you're worried about simply the patient having a uh, adrenal mass, but it's not really an adrenal mass. This was a patient who had a CT scan of the chest, and you could see what looks like a mass in the region of the adrenal gland. Very nicely shown. You see the right adrenal. You see the left adrenal. Adrenal protocol was ordered. Here's the lesion. But you can see when you look hard, this lesion actually is coming off the stomach. It's a gist tumor of the stomach. The left adrenal gland is seen and look normal. So I think one of the things when you send consultations, particularly of large adrenal masses, particularly on the left side, make sure you're really dealing with an adrenal mass. It could be a gastric mass or retroperitoneal mass. Now, when I look at an adrenal mass, I'm going to look also at the clinical history and presentation. Does the patient have a known primary? Is the patient Addisonian? Is the patient cushionoid? All of those things become critical. We'll then look at CT findings, size, unilateral versus bilateral. Most things can be bilateral, but certain things are more common. We'll look at the attenuation of the mass. What kind of enhancement pattern does it have? Does it have the presence of fat or the presence of calcification? As I mentioned, if you think about adrenal cortical carcinoma, the most common clinical presentation is Cushing's. Hypertension, we're always thinking about Theos. And patients um, you know, with um, other problems, we can think of things like primary aldosteronism. Now, when we talk about incidental lomas of the adrenal gland, and remember, most adrenal lesions are pick up incidentally, even things like pheochromocytomas, even things like ACC. The term for incidental loma is a non-functioning adrenal mass discovered on an imaging study performed for indications exclusive of adrenal-related conditions. And the management of the incidental adrenal mass has become challenging because we pick up so many of them and you just blow them off as adenomas or as some of the neuroendocrine people speak about or just the endocrine people in general suggest that an incidental lesion could be a chance of detecting an incidental functioning tumor and so you should always do lab values. And that's something that's being argued about these days and we'll talk about that as well. Now, if you look at just numbers, this is an older article by Song, but it was a very strong article. 1,049 consecutive adrenal masses in patients with no known malignancies. Okay, and you could see that in their series, 5% prevalence collaborates the 4.4% uh, from a recent series. In the old days, 1% to 2% of patients had incidental omas. I think 5% is probably a more likely number. Surely, if you're looking at adults over the age 50, with increasing age, the numbers will go up. But again, no malignancy, it's going to be benign. In this other article, 973 consecutive patients with incidental adrenal mass, no history of malignancy in any of these cases. 75% were adenomas, 6% were monolipomas. So the conclusion was, the results of our study show that none of the incidental detected adrenal masses with, was malignant in patients with no known malignancy. And the conclusion was, if an incidental adrenal mass appears benign on imaging, and the patient has no malignancy, follow-up has a limited role.
Now, I think in the big picture, that's going to be the case. It's a little bit challenging on the individual patient. Corwin did another study, very similar, looked at 322 cases with bilateral adrenal nodules, again with no history of cancer, and found all of these to be benign. So whether it's unilateral or bilateral, if it meets the criteria for adenoma, they're leave alone lesions. We found no case of malignancy in 322 incidentally detected bilateral adrenal nodules at CT of 161 patients who had no cancer. Okay, again, statistically, that's a very good rule, but it's not always going to be perfect. Now, when you look at adrenal lesions, I mentioned to you size. A good article from Mayo Clinic looking at 4,085 patients with adrenal lesions, 17% were over 4 cm, 705 cases. And you could see hair for women, mean age 59, tumor size 5.2. Diagnosis, 31% were benign adenomas, 22% were pheos. Other benign lesions, 16%. ACC, 13%, and other malignant tumors, 18%. So if you look at malignancy, 31% were malignant over 4CM, which basically means that 69% were benign. Now, obviously, in this series, they're considering pheos benign lesions, but as we know, pheos need to be resected. But still, 31% were adenomas. So at least a third of larger lesions are going to be benign. And that becomes very important. There's another article um, by Corwin that made the point that adrenal lesions can grow, so that's an important thing to remember. But they grow at less than three millimeters a year, while malignant nodules grow over five millimeters a year. So a very good rule, if you have an adrenal lesion today and it's 3CM and it was 1.8 on a study 10 years ago, don't think it's malignant. That's a slow growth rate. That's going to be benign. So a good thing to remember is benign adrenal lesions can indeed grow. Now, if you look at adrenal adenomas and you look at them in non-contrast CT, the typical rule forever is under 10 Hounsfield units, well-defined under 4 centimeters, is considered a benign adenoma. We then look at washout values. And there's a number of different articles about this, but typically if an adenoma, or let's say an adrenal lesion, is over 10 Hounsfield units, then you have to look at its washout value. Masses that have an absolute washout value of over 60% or relative of over 40% are typically going to be adenomas, and that's all. Masses that have an absolute washout of less than 60% or relative washout of less than 40% are considered indeterminate and require further workup. So let's look at some examples, but let's do this. Um, we've been here for about 18 minutes and change. Let's take a break. Let's come back and let's look at some examples. Be right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh, so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.